I give it another couple of minutes and uh, I really would like OC to, to be with us. Are we still short of a quorum? Uh, uh, no, we have a quorum. And I'm I'm just to uh, I'm just going to give her a call. Uh, so uh, uh, bear with me for a moment. Okay, OC is uh, joining us in uh, just a couple of minutes, but uh, uh, I guess we, we can uh, start without her. Um, so, uh, uh, my name is Steve. So I'm going to introduce myself, I'll begin the meeting now at um, uh, 6.38. Um, I'm Steve Simon. I'm the uh, chair of the Health and Environment Committee of uh, Community Board 12 Manhattan. Uh, welcome everyone. I'm uh, joined by uh, uh, a few of our uh, committee members right now, uh, Luis Cruz, uh, Jody Herson, uh, Jay Mazur, uh, OC Kamen will be uh, joining us momentarily, and uh, we're joined by uh, one of our new uh, uh, Community Board 12 members, uh, Tanisha Grant, and uh, uh, we're joined by uh, uh, Tanya Bonner, uh, whom uh, I now have to uh, introduce as, unfortunately, as a former uh, member of our committee and a, a former member of the uh, community board. Uh, but uh, uh, she uh, is here um, also in her uh, role as the uh, uh, chair of the Washington Heights Inwood Task Force on Noise. And um, uh, she is the person who uh, suggested uh, the first topic on our agenda, uh, which will be a, a presentation uh, from uh, DEP. But actually, before I get to that, um, I want to give uh, Diane Ashley a um, an opportunity. She, ha she has a, a family obligation, so I want to give her a chance to give her report. Uh, but actually, before I even get to Diane, I'm going to give uh, my uh, brief update on uh, COVID-19, as I do with uh, all of our meetings, um, which would serve as an intro uh, to uh, her report. So uh, let me just say that um, in terms of COVID-19, uh, interesting development today on the Department of Health website. Uh, they now indicate that um, uh, because the uh, federal public health, health emergency for COVID-19 has ended, uh, labs are no longer required to report a negative uh, test, uh, COVID uh, test results. Uh, multiple labs have stopped reporting these results, so we are no longer able to accurately calculate uh, percent uh, positivity and testing rates uh, for COVID-19. Uh, so I can no longer uh, provide the uh, positivity rates as I've been doing uh, for uh, uh, months on end, uh, but I can still report uh, the total number of cases in uh, Washington Heights and Inwood, uh, which is now uh, at 67,161 since the beginning of the epidemic, uh, of the pandemic. And uh, so that's a total of 119 new cases uh, since we met a month ago. Um, and uh, there has been one additional death, um, which obviously is uh, awful, uh, but uh, compared to uh, the numbers that we've had, you know, uh, in the 
previous months, it's uh, certainly declining. But the number of uh, cases is still at 100, we're still at 119. So uh, I, I still believe that it's uh, premature to suggest uh, that the pandemic is over. Um, and, our, uh, and our vaccination rates are still below uh, the citywide rates, still below, uh, below the uh, rates uh, for uh, the rest of Manhattan. Uh, we're, uh, we're running between 80 and 85% for people with first doses, uh, 72 to 75% for people who are fully vaccinated and uh, only at about 14% uh, for people who have had the uh, bivalent uh, uh, vaccines. Um, so uh, that's, those are the latest numbers from uh, the Department of Health and uh, Mental Hygiene. Uh, Diane, you have a report uh, from uh, Isabella. Oh, one, one second. Uh, uh, Jay, you have a question? Yeah, um, according to the city, since uh, those test results are no longer being required, the best indication of an uptick in COVID is the wastewater tests, which aren't really specific and are only samplings. And they indicate an uptick in the presence of COVID in wastewater. So people who have been noticing people on the subway and so on sniffling more are not imagining it. There is been there has been an increase in the last month. Uh, well, I uh, actually uh, why don't we uh, uh, why don't we ask Umberto after uh, Mark Page gives his presentation? I've been under the impression that uh, I'm not sure the DEP has been doing those wastewater tests. But uh, uh, maybe um, uh, Umberto can uh, clarify that point. According to the news today, they were. They are? This was oh. on the WNYC News at 6 o'clock. Oh, okay. All right. All right. All right. I thought at one point they, uh, they weren't considering it to be a reliable indicator. But okay. Why don't we uh, move now to uh, Diane Ashley uh, to give her report from uh, Isabella Geriatric Center. Uh, good evening, everybody. As of 6-1, so as of today, we have no residents who are positive for COVID, pleased to say. Um, we continue to educate and offer vaccination and booster shots. 90% have received the primary series of our residents. 74% have received at least one booster and 50% have received the bivalent vaccine and are, are considered up to date by DOH standards. Um, staff are all in compliance with DOH vaccination requirements. Um, we continue, as previously reported, and per DOH guidelines, visitors and staff are no longer required to test prior to entry. Uh, we continue to encourage it. Uh, we are also doing uh, passive screening um, and other infection control protocols like signage throughout the facility, uh, use of face coverings, um, and other uh, precautions. And um, we're obviously, as I said, still recommending that visitors test prior to seeing their loved one. But, but they're not required to uh, test. They are not required to test. All right, uh, Jay, you have a question? Yeah. Um, I believe it was last month, or it might have been the one, month before, I'd ask you to find out how many staff members at Isabella had died from COVID. And I explained prior to your hiring, we were <clears throat> informed in 2020 of three deaths. And I was wondering if any subsequent deaths from employees of COVID have been reported to your firm? So um, you asked at the last meeting, Jay, um, and we are not aware of any other staff deaths that are uh, tied to COVID beyond those original three sad losses. Uh, thank you, I'm glad to hear that. All Me right, too. very good. All right, uh, and we've now been uh, joined by uh, 
uh, OC uh, Kamina. Thank you, OC. And thank you, Steve, for putting me on early. I appreciate it. All right. Well, don't expect this. Uh, uh, I, I, my daughter's not moving to another state or anything another time. So I appreciate okay. it. <laughs> okay. Well, let's uh, tell, tell your daughter with that. We wish her the best. And, thank you uh, so much. And, and tell her we expect her to stay in uh, contact with her mother and uh, <laughs> to call at least uh, once a week. Thank you very much. I will pass that sage advice on to her. I appreciate it. Have a okay. good meeting all. I'm sorry I'll miss it. Okay, well, tell her, make sure she understands we're going to be following up to make sure. Okay. okay thank you. Bye-bye. All right, thank you. Um, all right, so now uh, I'm uh, very pleased to be able to introduce uh, uh, Mark uh, Page uh, Jr., uh, the Executive Director of the Bureau of Environmental Compliance uh, for the New York City Department of Environmental Protection. And uh, He's uh, joined by uh, one of our favorite uh, agency people, uh, Umberto Galarza, uh, from the Office of Community Affairs. And uh, um, uh, Mark is going to speak about a, uh, a very interesting project uh, that uh, DEP has initiated uh, using, uh, uh, I guess, what they call noise cameras. Uh, I want to hear what that means uh, to uh, enforce the uh, noise code uh, in our community. Uh, so, uh, uh, Mark, uh, uh, take it away. Sure, thank you. Let me just share my screen. Do you see my screen? Uh, not uh, now we can, yes. So thank you all for inviting me to give this presentation. As discussed, we're going to present on our noise camera program that started out as a pilot program in the beginning or middle of 2021 due to an increase in muffler noise. So like people who have aftermarket mufflers, gunning them and making a racket. Historically, DEP's done enforcement in partnership with the NYPD against that kind of noise, but it's very labor intensive, requiring multiple police cruisers and multiple DEP teams to be able to pull over the vehicle, take a reading and all that, and has to be scheduled. Whereas with the camera, we're able to do 24 seven enforcement with the camera, which has a microphone attached that is set up to only record video when the camera is triggered by a sound level above 85 decibels. And so then it captures a picture of the offending vehicle and we're actually able to issue summonses using that evidence gathered by the camera with the knowledge that it only gets recorded above 85 decibels with a standard that is at 76 decibels. So we give a nine decibel sort of buffer factor and we've actually had the cases that we've been able to bring to oath so far have had a very high success rate, approximately 90%, given we are able to just show the video and our camera. I don't have a clip from that. It's hard to do that over Zoom, but it actually has, since the beginning of this year, a little red dot that gets put on the loudest vehicle in that picture frame. What I'm showing you here now is the authority that we're able to use this program under. So the noise code only specifies that DEP can use equipment for enforcement. It doesn't specify what type of equipment. So talking to DEP attorneys and the law department and others and OATH has accepted it that use of this remote sensing technology is an acceptable method for doing remote enforcement. And with the passage of the SLEEP Act, in the beginning of last year, we increased the penalty under section 24236E. It used to be $250 for a first offense, but now as you can see, somebody receives a summons from us now and it's upheld by oath, they are served with a penalty of $800. And I can say anecdotally, our press office got reached out to by somebody who received a couple of summonses because he drove by the camera a couple of times and made too much noise. And 
after being told that yes if your vehicle makes too much noise you can receive this summons he told us he was going to sell his car and get a different car because it's no longer fun having a car that makes that much noise in new york city so right now we're issuing under the 24 236 section which is directly off the camera when we first initiated the program before we had established penalties under the penalty schedule for this use, we had been using 24206, which is us being able to direct people to come in to have their equipment inspected. So we use that to have cars come in to DEP properties and we'd take measurements of the sound levels that the aftermarket equipment made. And the only time a summons would be issued under that framework would be if they didn't respond to the order to appear. So, as I said, we started this program in 2021, middle of 2021. We mount the cameras on DOT street poles, and it has to be poles that have electric feeds through them and are strong enough to carry the camera. So some neighborhoods have wood street poles, which we're unable to use, but basically if it's a metal street pole that doesn't have equipment already hanging on it, like DOT cameras or other equipment, and DOT, and DOT approves us, we're able to put our cameras up. And I think I hit all of these other bullets. So the first defense is $800 and it's triggered by a 85 decibel sound level and the camera is positioned to look only at the street traffic and is at an elevation that it can't see into the vehicle it just basically the image would reflect off the windshield or the side windows and it's focused to try to enable us to hopefully be able to capture an image of the license plate from the vehicle and to use the plate to be able to issue the summons to the registered owner of the vehicle. So since the beginning of the program, we've had the cameras deployed in five different neighborhoods. Currently, the cameras are in Midtown Manhattan. We started out in Corona and when that pilot location was look, becoming fruitful and the events that were recorded were going down. We moved it to Astoria and then Inwood, we were doing a very successful location and the DOT did a street repaving and street painting project, stalling a bike lane, which dropped the numbers in that location exponentially. So we moved it to Midtown Manhattan. So, so wait, wait, is, is you're no longer in Inwood? Correct. But we are in the process of acquiring additional cameras. Like we have, we've had one camera since 2021 and we have deployed a second camera a couple of months ago. And hopefully now we're in June. Hopefully this month we will be getting nine additional cameras. They're in the process of being fabricated right now. Right, but, but but you only had one camera that you were uh, rotating rotating around, oh. correct? Oh, uh, so uh, um, can, can I assume that you're you'll be putting a um, a camera permanently up in Inwood uh, among the once you have the nine additional ones? Yeah, we have a lot of requests from elected officials, and we're reviewing through on one data. We're also working with 311 now because currently somebody calls in a complaint for muffler noise, it likely will get categorized as vehicle idling noise. Right. So we're working with 311 to better classify the complaint data to help us guide us in the best deployments and evaluating the effectiveness of the cameras. But if you have specific locations in Inwood where you'd recommend cameras be deployed, please feel free to email me or Umberto with those locations and we'll put them into the pot for consideration. 
Right, well, I, I'm sorry, I didn't really mean to interrupt uh, the presentation. No, that's fine. Uh, it, uh, well, why, I have a couple more questions, but let me save them uh, until you're uh, finished. Okay. So, as I said at the beginning, we started with the orders to appeal to appear, and then since March of 2022, we've been issuing directly from the camera. So we've issued 22 summonses for failure to appear and people, there's a small number, most people showed up when we asked them to come in, so that was good. And we've issued approximately 400 summonses off the cameras. That's been out of 2,500 events that have been recorded over that year or so since we've been able to issue summonses off the camera and a lot of the time the number is not as high on number of summonses versus event due to i know what question was about plate blockers and missing plates so about 25 percent of the events that we are able to record we're not able to identify the there is no plate or the plate isn't a real plate. So when we do a search for the registered owner, it doesn't come back with anybody. And then we have, we're working on getting higher resolution cameras that are able to help us in reading the plates. And sometimes the video that we're capturing, we can't read the plate or the plate is obstructed by a adjacent car or something like that. And then we also have a, events that are recorded due to non-vehicle noise. So if somebody sets off a firecracker next to the microphone, it would capture that event since it's over 85 decibels, but there's no vehicle to pursue. So we've, since early 2022, we've issued 250 summonses for muffler engine noise. And since the beginning of this year, when we started, we added in horn honking and vehicle music to offenses that we're pursuing with the camera. We've issued 50 horn honking summonses. To date, we've not issued any music related offenses or summonses, but it's only actually gotten warm enough for people to open their windows in the last week or two. So I think as the summer progresses, we'll be getting more of those. As I said, we've ordered an additional nine cameras. We did put in a new need request to greatly expand the program, but due to the fiscal situation in the city, OMB did not approve our new need so far. So we have the nine that we're buying this fiscal year, so FY23, and we're seeking to get funding for FY24, but so far that has not been approved. And as I stated earlier, we're working with 311 and NYPD to better classify muffler engine noise as its own complaint category, since a lot of the time it gets lumped in with vehicle idling, which isn't what our camera is trying to capture. And as I said, we've moved the camera a few times due to the decline in events being recorded at sites. As we increase the number of cameras, we're looking to keep the cameras in more long-term deployment at specific locations. So that was my presentation and I'm happy to answer any questions. Well, thank you. Let me just uh, begin uh, before I recognize a couple of other people who have questions. Um, so did, did, did you have a, a number for how many uh, violations you issued uh, uh, based on the camera that was uh, uh, stationed up in Inwood? I don't have that number at my fingertips, but I think we, at the beginning of the deployment there, we were getting around 200 events a week and then pursuing about 10 or 12% of those. So 20. 20 summonses a week. And then with the repainting project, 
the numbers drop from that to like five or 10 a week events being recorded. And and the, the reason that you were, uh, when you, an, an event is uh, has been triggered uh, by, by a vehicle that's been making noise, uh, but uh, you were only able to issue uh, summonses in 10% of those cases. And, um, and then what, what's that, that can't all be due to the fact that uh, uh, the license plates are uh, obscured or, uh, or, or, or didn't exist. I mean, why, why would there be such a low percentage of summonses that you were able to issue? Yeah, well, events are when the microphone records above 85 decibels. So the camera will record an event if somebody has a boombox going off on the sidewalk or a police car goes by with a siren going off or a car backfires. So there's a lot of events are triggered by just loud noises that we're not able to pursue or somebody goes by with an ATV. The ATV doesn't have a license plate, so we can't pursue an ATV with the camera or motorcycles go by a lot of them are the cameras at an elevation that it can't read a license plate of a motorcycle very easily. So unfortunately, there's a number of scenarios where we can't identify the registered owner of the vehicle or it's not a vehicle or other circumstance. But we're trying to get higher percentage of summonses versus events with better deployments of the camera so it's able to get a better angle to see license plates or higher resolution cameras. One of our second cameras is actually from a separate company that we're hoping we're still working through the bugs on install and getting it to fully operate properly. But we're hoping with that camera, it'll be a better system. All right. Well, I was certainly hoping that uh, this was one way to capture the uh, uh, the motorcycles, which are really, uh, uh, you know, a major part of our problem in uh, in Washington Heights and Inwood. And 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 actually, uh, let me just ask: what, um, I'm I'm certainly hoping that you're going to put back a camera in Inwood. I would also recommend that you put one in the Washington Heights. I mean, this is uh, unfortunately, I think, fertile territory uh, for issuing uh, noise summonses and. Uh, uh, I, I guess, as you may have already found out. So uh, I'm, I'm hoping that with the additional cameras, uh, you, uh, I, you, you would be able to cover uh, uh, both uh, both ends of our community district. Um, all right, so let, yes. let me- uh, Yeah, that... well, please feel free to send me intersections or actually mid-block is best, but mid-block locations that have metal poles that don't already have other stuff hanging on them that you would recommend that we evaluate. All right, very good. All right, thank you. Um, uh, Jay, you, you have a, a question or a comment? Uh, Jay? All right. Let me let me move on to uh, uh, OC and uh, and then to uh, Tanya. Okay. <clears throat> so um, you mentioned something about the uh, the cost of the camera, and do you have any calculation as to how many events, or I should say, how many summonses you need to? Um, um, issue in order to cover the cost of the camera. And I'm saying, I'm asking that, and I know it sounds a little odd, but I wonder if our government officials um, are not pushing it because of the cost issue, or are they pushing it, but it's not really clear how it's going to get funded? No, well, the summons is $800 mm -hmm. and the camera with full all its bells and whistles is around $35,000. So it does not take many events or many sustained summonses to be able to pay for the camera. 
And that was part of our argument when we were seeking the funding to expand the program. Okay. And our government officials in, in Washington Heights Inwood are asking for those cameras or they're not aware of them or they don't want to pursue that issue? I believe that many council members have expressed interest in the cameras, but it's we, we talk directly with the Office of Management and Budget mm -hmm. and as part of the executive budget, so far, our request has not been funded. Okay, um, so uh, uh, Steve, I think that we need to highlight that to our government officials in how important it is. I I agree. Yeah, I yeah. I mean, uh, I I wouldn't expect uh, Mr. Page. That's not really his role uh, to be lobbying uh, our council members. Right. Uh, 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 that's certainly something that. Uh, uh, that we we can uh, we can do, uh, 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 Steve. Yeah, ba uh, yeah, Jay. Uh, one second, uh, OC. Are you are you uh, done? Yes, thank okay. you. All right, uh, Jay. Uh, over to you. Uh, first of all, I, I wanted to say, although there are a lot of weaknesses in this program, at least it's a beginning on an important question, and we hope it'll continue and be improved, like everyone has said. I was just wondering, simply, you mentioned there's one, there's going to be nine others, that equals 10. Does that mean there's going to be two to, for each borough? That it's something we are considering. We haven't fully nailed down the locations where the additional nine will get deployed. Part of it is we need sites that work with for the camera yeah i i, I, well, I, I lower I, manhattan I, is yeah. very busy with other things hanging on poles so your neighborhood is less busy with other equipment all right thank you um uh D D tanya uh, thank you, Steve. Um, thanks, uh, Mark, for joining us today and giving this update. Very much appreciate it. And uh, for all of your continued work uh, in collaboration with our community, um, as Steve mentioned, um, here representing the YN with Task Force on Noise. And, um, you know, as Steve was mentioning, we have a lot of problems with the motorcycles up here. Uh, many, many problems. And of course, as you mentioned, that in the summer, especially loud music playing throughout our residential areas. Um, I also feel that, the, you know, this program needs to be expanded uh, into Washington Heights as well as Inwood. And I wanted to ask in terms of right now, what you're doing, how are you using the data that you are given? What do you plan to do with this data? How are you using it um, in terms of, what is your plan with the data in terms of evaluating it, in terms of, you know, what is the next stage in terms of this program? Um, and, uh, you know, cause I'm very curious about what happens. A lot of times we have data, like we love data in the city. You know, we love to gather a bunch of data but then it come, comes about an issue of enforcement. Like what do we do once we get the data and you know so that's really essentially my question like how is this going to be enforced how is the data going to be used those are my two first essential questions thank you no thank you and thank you for inviting me so for the data question right now we have the data on the events that we are able to gather and our ability to pursue summonses as I said earlier, we are working with 301 and NYPD to be able to better use 301 data. Because right now we have anecdotal people like this meeting saying they have lots of vehicles making noise and that gets fed into how we deploy the camera and the future cameras and elected officials telling us similar scenarios. We're hoping what we can get through in one to establish that additional 
complaint category. So then we would be able to better use that data to determine what areas currently have a problem. And then we deploy a camera and see how does the complaint numbers change with the deployment of the camera. Like, as I said, we've had a few anecdotal stairs, like the Astoria location. Somebody was reaching out to us and saying their neighborhood has had a lot of muffler noise. Then we deployed the camera and that same person reached out and said, it's gotten a lot quieter. That's great, thank you for putting the camera here because he was able to figure out where our camera was in his neighborhood. And then we moved, when it got really good, we moved it to another location because we had the one camera and we wanted to be able to hit other hotspots in the city. He then contacted us and let us know that people realized the camera was gone and the numbers went up again. So we're looking into, in addition to real cameras, potential fake cameras to put up and leave up in neighborhoods. So we may not have the real thing, but hopefully the fake thing will keep people from misbehaving. Steve, may I ask one more question? Yeah, sure, Please. go ahead. Um, thank you, first of all, for that information. My next question would be in terms of, you mentioned the deterrent. How have, have we determined that these cameras are a deterrent? Like, has it helped in the numbers? Have you noticed in the beginning when these were placed and then the numbers started to decline? It, has this been acting as a, as a deterrent? And the last question was about the paper plate because that's a big problem. How do you all plan to overcome that challenge of people? What do you plan to do with that information when you do capture a vehicle with paper plates that you cannot, you know, with the fake paper plates? Thank you. Yep. Thank you. So for the events, yeah, we do no notice, like when we first deploy the camera, we have a lot more events recorded than after it's been there and people started receiving summonses for the offenses that, that got recorded when we first deployed the camera, those people likely, they get an $800 summons. They realize, because on the summons, it says where they got the summons. So they realize I'm probably not gonna go do my loud muffler noise in that location. And we're hoping that'll also help with people just honking their horn gratuitously and also with vehicle music, hopefully this summer, we'll be able to help with that problem too. And the paper summonses, we do, we are collecting the some of the videos that we get with the paper summonses and working, sending them to NYPD and Sheriff to be able to help them pursue those crimes. Uh, thank you. Uh, and now uh, from uh, the uh, city's leading expert on uh, noise issues, uh, uh, Dr. Arlene Bronzat. Uh, you should unmute yourself because uh, then we can hear you. Do you hear me? Uh, yes, uh, go ahead. Okay. Mark, thank you for the presentation. And you all know I'm a data-oriented person. Let me ask Mark this. New York City is not the only city that's been experimenting with cameras and other cities in Europe have had comparable problems that you've had. Less than 20% of the summonses issued have actually led to people paying violations. Mm -hmm. And one of the major problems is to differentiate the sound of the car as it passed the camera from other sounds that may intrude upon it. So that is a complication and one that other cities have had to deal with as you had to deal with. Have you written a report that has an introduction to how this study has been initiated and will it list the locations where you've had the cameras and all the other data you gave, but it should be in some formal writing. But then you did say that where the cameras existed, there seemed to be a lessening of noise complaints, people 
articulated that? Was that in some way written up? In other words, I think at this point, and you do have data, and the data that you've collected, whatever it is, is valuable. But can we get a written report that stipulates what you've told us with tables that show us how many violations have been issued, which ones were successful, in other words, the things you've told us, and have you compared New York City's data with the data of other cities? Because we can learn from their experiences. So I think as a start, this is terrific. But you did say you started two years ago in 2021, correct? So I just want to know if I could access a written report that would detail what you have told us today, but in its introduction, explain how things have been done and looking at other cities, have you made comparisons? Have you had dialogue? Have you in some way interacted? And we have been able to improve maybe based on some of their experiences. So thanks, Mark, very much. It's a good start, really good start. Yeah, thank you. We've had a number of conversations with other, well, actually other U.S. and international cities. Good. And a lot of them are looking at us as a example of how they should establish their program. They're also very, I'll say, impressed that our noise code gives us the flexibility and the penalty amount that we've assigned to these violations. Good. Since a number of other municipalities either don't have the authority to use remote sensing for this kind of enforcement, or they don't think they can establish a penalty of that magnitude. So we have had conversations with other cities in the United States, and they actually inquire on which technology we're using. And we've had conversations internationally, including as you point out, some European cities have these deployed and we're in conversations with the companies that support those deployments, trying to get the, the most cutting edge to be able to help us with these techn technical problems that have made well, it, mm -hmm. our, our success rate at not as high as we would want it to be. So, so and, are, are we the first, uh, am I hearing that we're the first uh, uh, US? No. no, we're not, okay. Uh, the there, are other, there are other United uh, cities in the United States. Okay. There's a handful of cities in the United States. Knoxville, Tennessee is using the same camera technology that we are using. Right. And we were told by the company that provided the camera that we were the first city or location in the world that deployed what they call their halo dot as part of a enforcement project. So that's the, they have a, a device that's able to, using microphones, figure out which vehicle is the one making the most noise and puts a little red dot, which helps our inspectors figure out what vehicle in that three-lane road is the one that actually is making the noise. Is there a written report that somebody could ask for? I would like to see a written report. It's like when I did my study, on the children having lower test scores, working with DP, lower test scores, people said we have to see the actual data. So have you prepared some report that's uh, up to date because you haven't reached you know, the points you wish to reach that someone can look at and gain some knowledge as to what has been done and maybe raise some questions as to which could assist you as you move forward. So can I access a written report on what you presented today? So right now we don't have a written report that okay. is ready for public dissemination, but- Okay, so not that, accessible to the public yet. Not but, yet. But are you, are you uh, uh, can you make Arlene happy and uh, tell her that you're planning mm -hmm. to do such a report? Yes, 
we want to do a report. It's we just have to figure out when is the right step in the process okay. to. Okay, but, our, okay, but our, our, our lead at report. our lead at some point will get the report that she wants. Yeah. <laughs> and, and well, the, I, you and, know what? And, we laugh and, about it. And the, Remember and the, the movie "Show Me the Money." Right, I right, would right. say "Show Me the Data." Right, exactly. No, definitely, because once there's a report, uh, we're gonna we're gonna bring you back uh, so you can uh, 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 give us. Thank uh, you. Give us your vantage point to explain uh, uh, what, what's been found. Uh, so, yes, I would also like to see a report because I want to have Arlene back here. Uh, so uh, uh, thank you. Uh, now, there, there are. Um, um, so uh, Umberto points out that uh, we started with one camera in 2021. And since then, have, uh, uh, now I just lost him. Um, and uh, since then, have uh, rotated the camera to test in locations and locations requested uh, by the NYPD and council members. We currently have two. Uh, we have procured nine cameras, uh, which we will receive soon. Well, ho hopefully uh, uh, hopefully by the end of the month, I guess, by the end of the fiscal year. And- um, Mark, Mark, is that correct? We have we currently ha just have two? Correct. Thank okay. you. All right. All right, and what was that on Berto? Yes. Oh, very good. Okay. Um, I'm using my speaker. Yeah, okay. Uh, all right, so there are a couple of other questions here. Um, um, and um, uh, so uh, Lynn Sheward, who, by the way, points out uh, that you can make up the cost of the uh, camera, the $35,000, uh, after uh, issuing uh, uh, just, uh, what is it, 44 summonses uh, at, uh, at 800 apiece. And if you get some repeat uh, uh, violators, it uh, would even be uh, fewer than that. But for 44 uh, first time violators, and right away you can make back uh, uh, the cost of the camera. Uh, but Lynn has another question, or maybe we just answered it. Um, uh, uh, there is there still just one camera which gets moved around? Well, okay, so the answer is at this point, we have, uh, they have two, and uh, shortly there'll be nine more. Um, uh, Marcus uh, Hilpert, um, I would like to ask whether the cameras are being installed only in neighborhoods or also with traffic arteries uh, leading into Manhattan, uh, uh, that is on the bridges. Um, uh, so uh, Mark, what would be the answer to that question? So we have to put them on like one, two, maybe if a really a good spot, three lane roads to be able to identify the offending vehicle. The road is too congested then it becomes very difficult to figure out which vehicle is the one that right. making all the noise uh and, and and frankly i think um uh if they're making noise on a bridge they're not necessarily disturbing uh, local residents so uh eh, and I'm, from my point of view uh i i'd rather see these cameras in uh, residential neighborhoods uh um um, uh, Stephanie uh, Fitzhugh, I I'd like to say as a proponent for the Sleep Act uh, during its time going through Albany, how thrilled I am to hear that from Mr. Page, uh, the anecdote about the young man who will be selling his car uh, rather than uh, uh, continuing to receive fines. Uh, uh, this law is working. Um, and uh, there was some one other one here. Hold on a moment. Um, yeah, uh, Janine Nabata, is there a way for an area to receive consideration for having a noise camera other than 311? Uh, you can have a neighborhood with chronic, predictable horn honking, uh, road rage for hours every day, uh, but no one submits 311 complaints for that. Um, well, how, how do you respond to that? I'd recommend. Either you can go through the community board to reach out to elected officials or email me or Umberto with recommended locations. All right, very good. Um, all right, uh, uh, Lynn Sheward has some other questions. Uh, uh, all right, uh, uh, Lynn. Um, All right, uh, Lynn, you should now be able to talk. 
Great. Uh, hi, can you guys hear me? Yes. Excellent. So thrilled. Um, okay, a couple of quick questions. So the nine cameras that are anticipated at the end of the month, those we have funds to pay for them. Th those are not contingent on the approval of the budget. Is that an accurate statement? Correct. They were approved as part of the last budget for F fiscal year 23. Great. Okay. So what I'm hearing in terms of leverage to really move this program further is that whatever additional funding is being requested in the upcoming budget, that needs to get approved. So is that nine additional cameras or is there a different amount of money for the upcoming budget that I think Adams is like, that's in the works right now and um, you know, in the headlines? The FY24 ask, I don't remember the number off the top of my head, but it was more than nine. More than nine. Do you remember? It was more than staff? nine, and then uh, then associated yeah. staff to run it. Which, Got it. Do you like, have a dollar figure? It was probably a few hundred thousand dollars. Okay, this is why I'm asking because if folks in the Wahai Noise Task Force and others want to advocate to their city council people, having that dollar figure is really important because we can say it's only three hundred k or four hundred k or whatever it is, and then that in the whole scope of the budget it's not a big ask i think the more specifics that we have to present to our city council people the more effective the case for support if you could get that information to steve and then that could get passed along to tanya that would be really helpful and then we can be an advocate for dep and help you guys secure this money um that was going to be one of my other questions it's yeah not I just, just sorry go ahead right no i fully agree with you and when we've had conversations with council members, we've had to explain that we can't just get the expense funds to buy the cameras, because if we end up with too many cameras, then we don't have the staff resources to be able to review the video and issue the summonses, and then it gets bogged down. So it needs to be done equipment and staff resources to be able to handle the program. Well, that, that certainly that certainly makes sense, and I think uh, you know a, a, everyone should be able to understand that. I mean, it's uh, yeah. you, you, you certainly would need to have the uh, right the, to to uh, process uh, you know to 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 do the work and to review the data. Um, the other thing, I'm, I'm sorry, Steve, didn't mean to cut you off there. So when we advocate, we can make clear it's not just the cameras. You need the folks to do all the support work with it. Has anyone done any analysis of how much? time and money it saves NYPD, that they're not following up on these things. So that's one thought. And then the other thought, it seems like the other leverage area is getting that classification code um, in 311 for the type of complaint changed. How can we as citizens advocate for that? Is something that that's in the bowels of the bureaucracy of the government that we can't have any effect on? Or what can we do to help make that happen? It's a good question. Okay, that implies you, that we would need to maybe explore that a little further. <laughs> yes, yeah, that, yeah that, that that may be a little bit outside uh, Mark's uh, domain, but uh, yes, that, but uh, but but you but you've said that you're already uh, uh, talking to people at three one one about clarifying the. Uh, Miss uh, Tanya is yeah. Another team is working on that. So well, no, okay. I, I, I thought Mark said he was uh, working on that. Yes, yeah, so I'm in well, conversations okay. with three one one and NYPD. Okay. Well, again, if there's a way in which that citizens can be helpful to advocate for this, tell us what to do. We will do it. We believe in this project. We think it's going to save resources. It's going to reduce conflicts with NYPD and drivers. It's so smart. And I think if we can emphasize that to our electeds, we can really push this through and we can grow this. I think it's a win-win for everyone. So thank you for persevering and, and thanks for recognizing me, Steve. Really appreciate it. No, I'm, I'm glad I recognize you. You had some very good questions. Um, but, uh, and, and again, I want to uh, uh, reinforce what Lynn has said, because we are at a uh, crucial stage in the budget process. Uh, so if you are at liberty to tell us what the number is, uh, what, what it is that you need uh, to uh, expand uh, the program effectively, it would certainly would help us uh, to, uh, uh, to make the case with, uh, uh, with the council members. Um, so uh, I, I hope that we can hear from you on that point. Um, uh, so uh, uh, Arlene, is that a new hand? Uh, 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 maybe not. Uh, Tanya, uh, is that a new hand? Yes, I, I just wanted to say to Mark, 
if there's a way we can get, you know, I know you mentioned it, you know, uh, a, a, a little bit, but data in terms of what the cameras were able to accomplish in our community, because that would be helpful too when uh, when residents are doing their outreach and doing their advocacy, yeah. that we have that and we, we we can be able to speak to that. Is there a way that we can get this this data? Or you can get it to Steve and... and yeah, we'll, we'll go back and hopefully in the next few days we can see what we can provide. Yeah, that would that would be fantastic. Very good. Thank Very, you. Yeah, that would be wonderful. That's helpful. Yeah. Um, uh, also, are, are there any that other would be questions? helpful? Uh, any any other questions? Uh, all right, uh, Lynn, is that a new question or? Uh, yep. One more from Lynn. Go ahead. Oh, you need to, am I still unmuted? Can you guys hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Excellent, okay. So final jeopardy observation. If in Inwood, we only had a 10 to 20% summons rate, what that says to me is it's truly indicative of a major problem, that it's all those fake license plates, it's those blockers of license plates, it's the number of ATVs and motorcycles. So it doesn't what it, it doesn't do, it doesn't say, okay, the program is not working. What it says is there are other problems that need to be addressed there. Like, you know, Mark was talking about the motorcycles, but I think that it, it's, it, it surfaces all these other problems that we're dealing with. You can't walk down the street in Inwood or Wah Heights and not see the paper plates, the illegal plates or the cars even without plates, which is, you know, a, it's a whole other thing. So I just wanted to make that observation. Steve, uh, are motorcycles going to be included? Are motorcycles included in this or they're not? I know, Steve, you asked that. Can, I, I didn't keep that clear. It is well, not. Well, I, I, well the, the, uh, what Mark said, if I remember correctly, is that it's uh, difficult to pick up on the uh, uh, license plates on the motorcycles uh, because of how low they are to the ground and uh, maybe they're not visible from the cameras. Yeah, so a lot of the motorcycles have their plate behind the seat. Mm -hmm. So when the camera is up here, it sees the top of the seat and not the plate. Yeah, but I tell you, a lot of them uh, are, are like zooming up and down uh, Broadway, and they're uh, uh, and, and they're raising the uh, the front wheel. They're way up in the air. But 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 even then, maybe uh, uh, then the uh, license. Well, they only they only have the plate in the back. So yeah, so, so then you can't see that either. Yeah, what a shame because that's one of our major uh, uh, problems. Uh, the, the, those motorcycles are just nuts. All right, well, I want to thank you, Mark, and I, I hope uh, uh, that uh, you'll uh, come back to us uh, uh, every now and then. Well, no, after you finish your report, uh, then you'll come back to us, and uh, both you and Arlene will uh, uh, will interpret it for us. Um, so uh, uh, thank you. Uh, I appreciate uh, your coming here. Uh, Umberto, did you have anything you wanted to add? Did, did you want to give the report that I usually give on the, uh, monthly, uh, uh, on the monthly service request from our community to uh, DEP? Sure, if you would like me to, and and thanks for your time, Mark. Okay. Yeah, thank you. So, no more questions for me. Thank Have you. A good night. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. You've, uh, uh, Mark. Uh, uh, you've done a, a yeoman service tonight. So, uh, thank you, and uh, we'll 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 bring you back uh, uh, um, at some point, and uh, hopefully, you'll mm -hmm. give us an update, and especially after you've managed to uh, install cameras in both Inwood and Washington Heights. Um, That's good. Mm -hmm. all, right. all right. Thank you. Thank you. And, you know, so Tanya, uh, Tanya, we should not forget this point. We 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 need to uh, pick uh, take him up on his offer. We need to recommend uh, locations in both Washington Heights and Inwood. All right. Thank you, Mark. Thanks, Mark. Uh, uh, Umberto, thank you. You, want to talk, you want to talk about the 223 uh, complaints from uh, Washington Heights and Inwood residents in May? Uh, sure. Only because you asked. Uh, Steve, um, <laughs> and I appreciate that. Um, thanks for having us and Mark. Uh, Mark's been a busy, busy person uh, lately, as as you know. Uh, noise has uh, increased uh, since the pandemic, as, as again, as you all are aware. Um, but uh, always good sharing information with you, Steve. And yes, uh, for your district, Steve, and board members, um, these are the top 30 DEP uh, 301 complaints. Well, just, 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 just give us the uh, top uh, three. For, uh, five. Well, oh, I usually five. do three. Okay. Four. Yeah, sure. Okay. okay. So it was, it was a total of 223 for the month of May. The top five are hydrants running full with 24 complaints. 
hydrant running with 22 complaints, uh, uh, dog barking noise complaints with 22. We have construction before after hours, uh, noise complaints with 19. And then we have um, odor, fumes, vehicle idling with 16. Th those, uh, that, that category generally is about vehicle idling. So I would say close to 100% of those 16 are about vehicle idling. Right. Um, the first two hydrant running full, um, sometimes it's left open. Sometimes it's just a leak from the hydrant and dog barking. As we all know, one interesting point since the pandemic, people have gotten more pets, more dogs, and now they're back at work. The dogs, um, kind of, you know, miss their pet owners, um, and construction before, after hours, that's, that's usually, uh, before 7.00 AM after 6.00 PM. But a lot of people just batch up some construction noise complaints to that, um, 19, Overall, 200 around, that's what you guys average for your district. Yeah. Is that is that all, Steve? Um, well, unless there are some questions. Um, I, I don't see any. Uh, unless, uh, uh, Lynn, is that, a new, is that a question for Umberto? Uh, probably, yeah. probably not. All right, very good, Umberto. It's, uh, uh, you know, usually I have to give this report for you. So uh, uh, this is great uh, that you were able to do it uh, yourself. And, uh, and I want to thank you publicly for uh, every uh, month you've been able to uh, give us these, send these reports to us uh, like clockwork. And, uh, and I can't believe that today, June the 1st, you already had the report ready for the month of May. Uh, so uh, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, Steve. Also, I'll, I don't want to get myself into trouble, but I'll answer the, um, the COVID SARS question really quickly. Oh, yeah, please. Uh, yes. Yeah. About the, about the, uh, uh, the, the wastewater. Yes. Uh, so very briefly, um, we continue to do monitoring testing at our wastewater treatment uh, plants. Uh, however, the only caveat, the only difference is CDC, um, I believe in since 2022, had uh, their contractor do the uh, collections and uh, the monitoring. So uh, we were doing it uh, since 2020 ourselves in our DEP labs, but uh, I believe I begin since la I, I believe since last year CDC had their own contractor come in, uh, do the collections, um, and the information should still be uh, uploaded uh, in the New York City por uh, portal, open data. Uh, I believe it's biweekly or monthly. I've gotten some calls where, you know, they're waiting for the information. It hasn't been uploaded. Um, but, uh, yeah, it, it, it should be uh, on open data. Um, and, again, it's led by CDC. Oh, thank you. Well, Lynn Sheward is uh, forwarded to us or posted in the uh, chat a, uh, an article from uh, Gothamist, uh, uh, today's Gothamist, on this question. So uh, uh, people on the committee uh, sh uh, should be able to uh, to access that. Well, uh, thank you, Umberto. And, thank uh, you. And um, thank you. I, I appreciate you joining us tonight. Uh, let, let me move the agenda on now to uh, a, a very important topic. I'm very pleased to uh, uh, that uh, uh, Professor uh, uh, Gandahari, hope that I'm pronouncing it correctly, uh, from a uh, professor from the Department of Civil and Urban Engineering from the uh, uh, NYU was attending the School of Engineering has joined us. And um, uh, the, he is one of the uh, researchers who would, who did a uh, recently uh, 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 published uh, the results of a study concerning uh, air pollution found in uh, various subway stations throughout the city and uh, and, and concluded that the worst um, levels of air pollution were in uh, two of our subway stations at 181st Street and at 168th Street on the uh, number one line. So obviously this is very uh, concerning to us. So, uh, uh, pr uh, Professor, could you uh, go into some more detail about what it is you found and uh, uh, wh what it uh, suggests for us? Sure, uh, Steve. Thank you um, for reaching out and uh, <clears throat> and and do please let me know if uh, my voice cuts out since I'm overseas and and that the the, uh, the bandwidth is not so great. Um, so yes, the, <clears throat> so we met, we actually, it was a fairly comprehensive, I would say perhaps the most comprehensive 
study on on air pollution uh, or air quality in the in in any subway system perhaps I mean, we measured every single subway station uh, and we measured every single train at one second cadence from the beginning to the end and um, <clears throat> um, and and what we were measuring we were measuring uh, concentrations of uh, particulate matter and and uh, sort of the standard uh, measure is uh, small particles, uh, particles that are um, size smaller than two and a half microns. Hence, uh, these particles are called PM 2.5, particulate matter 2.5 or smaller. And the reason uh, uh, these are, uh, this small size is targeted is because they're small enough that can basically penetrate the lung tissue into bloodstream and hence um, the well-known um, adverse health effects, uh, including cardiovascular uh, diseases, um, respiratory disease, and more so these days, um, um, sort of, um, uh, you know, sort of neurological uh, disorders. And these are basically the metal ions in these particles that are largely from combustion of fossil fuels, right? Uh, have uh, been known to have toxicity. These are neurotoxins as well as um, causing toxicity that, as I mentioned, results in cardiovascular and, and respiratory diseases. So, so that's why, um, for example, the Environmental Protection Agency has set limits on um, concentrations of these particle, uh, particulate matters of 2.5 and smaller to be 35 microgram per cubic meter or less, right? So uh, 35, so basically a concentration uh, mass per uh, unit volume. Um, and these are hourly averaged. So if, if, for example, you're out in the street on Broadway, let's say, and you make measurements with a good instrument and uh, you reach uh, you make measurements uh, for a whole hour continuously and you take an average of the concentration, it should not exceed 35 microgram per cubic meter. So what we did is that we did the same thing except underground and we found that um, on stations, on average uh, concentration, the mean value of the entire New York City subway system is approximately 150. So we're talking about five times larger than allowable. Of course, these were 15 minute average, not one hour average. So, uh, you know, if, if, if the EPA would have, if, if the US EPA would have done 15 minute average, probably the 35 microgram would have been increased to 40 micrograms. So we're still, you know, four, four times more than the allowable. Now, um, that is 150 mean value for the entire New York City's uh, subway stations or platforms. Um, so before I, I, I mentioned what was the rest of the concentration, you may ask, well, what the heck? There are no cars down here. <laughs> Where, where's all this particulate matter coming from? Right. Well, one of the things that we did is that we also did composition analysis, which we took uh, samples of these particles through filters, took them to very sophisticated um, equipment at the medical center up in uh, uh, and at uh, 21st Street, then YU Medical, uh, you know, um, the, and, and also in Tuxedo, New York, then YU Medical uh, um, facilities. And we found that uh, these particles are very heavy in iron, much, 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 much more than you get in the outdoor. And, and then, so the hypothesis here is that these particles are created by abrasion of the wheels to the rails and of the brake systems of these things. So, um, so now let me tell you um, what the rest were. So we said EPA says 35. Of course, EPA standards have been set not for high iron, but for other uh, metal ions, including iron. So. Uh, one thing I should say then here right away before making everybody scared is because uh, it's important to point this out that we don't have data on the adverse health outcomes of high iron content particulate matter 2.5. But 
My guess is that um, uh, it, it, it's it's if we did, or and the studies are now beginning to start, we, we are actually beginning to do these kinds of studies. I can't imagine they are good for you. Let's put it this way, all right? I can't imagine that these small particles that are higher in iron content versus the outdoor environment are actually good for you. So having said that, uh, now let us get to the rest of the thing. So uh, number one train uh, had more than... Uh, platforms of number one train had on average 200 microgram per cubic meter, not 150 for average, which was the average of New York City, but 168 and 181st had 600. So now you would imagine, you would ask, well, why is it that you have such high concentrations up there? Well, you know, we have not actually done causation analysis. In other words, we, we can, that's the next step. Uh, we wonder whether it has to do with uh, curvature of the rails, whether it has to do with the, the distance between um, stops and so the more braking has to be done. We have, actually haven't done that. This is, this is just out of the box. This was published two weeks ago. And um, however, I have to add that what was what I hoped for for this uh, publication to uh, 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 you know cause or to result was some action by MTA saying, hey, uh, this is uh, interesting um, and informative. Let's look to see what we could learn and perhaps come up with uh, you know a plan to figure out whether something can be done with it. I mean, me as an engineer, I appreciate the <laughs> very difficult job of running a hundred year old uh, train system. Okay, so let's start with that. Okay, and I understand that there is not enough money. <laughs> so that part of it, I also understand. But the response I heard in the New York Post article about this particular research that was done, the response by MTA was that we have done measurements and we found we have found that there is no problem and that the air is completely safe now uh, you know i uh, i i was a bit surprised and and i think this should be challenged so anyway so that's basically my uh, and if I, you have any questions i i'd be more than happy to answer yeah well um i uh, my conclusion was that maybe the cause could be uh, the, uh, the the depth of those subway stations, that somehow there's no uh, uh, very limited air circulation, uh, no ventilation, that maybe that's a, a contributing factor. Is, is that something that you, may, uh, that, that you may have given some thought to? Absolutely. I think, uh, Steve, you should join the research team and, 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 and we probably will do better with you. Yes, indeed. Um, I, uh, that was, we, we, we have a number of variables that one could play with and what could analyze, including the depth, including the curvature, including the, uh, the speed, including the stopping time, all of those things, which we have not. And this is actually what I was referring to, learning from the data. Um, I believe one of your colleagues, I think uh, it was... Um, um, I forget the, the actually is, uh, Tanya, I think it was who, yeah. who, who oh, our, perhaps well, mentioned our, that. Yeah. Well, Dr. Bronzaft was the one who was really. Uh, uh, yeah, there you are. Yeah. Mm -hmm, yeah. So, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, so those, yeah, indeed it could be. It could be that this, uh, the, what it is, is, is this, is that these particles, in the case of the subway system, these particles continuously uh, are generated and deposited. And so, as you said, if there is no way to escape, <laughs> it accumulates. And I should add that the concentrations were high every time a train went by. Right. So, and that is because it churns up all the stuff at the bottom of the rails right. and basically aerosolizes it, puts it in the air. And then when the train goes by, it slowly dissipates in, in value, the concentration value. You, you mean when when the train pulls out of the station? Yeah. So so basically basically we were to and we've done these time series measurements. We actually have for every single station that uh, you measure you you're continuously monitoring. There's no trains. It's fairly low. 
Right. As soon as the train approaches, the concentration shoots up in the air, okay? And then it stays high and then the train leaves the station. And uh, in another five minutes, three, four, four, five minutes, the concentrations are back down again. Well, and how, how, over what, you, you, you measured every single, I mean, I forget how many subway stations there are. Every <laughs> single FN station in the city of New York City. Yes. I, I don't know, maybe, maybe, <laughs> maybe there are 500 of them or something. Well, more. There, there is 438, yeah, 438 stations. We measured every single station, yeah. So, so you, you, did, every, you did this every work platforms. over, and, and you did this work over what period of time? We had a, a fairly large team and we did this, whole thing in a period of one week because we wanted to make sure no, we're catching a snapshot. One, one. Yeah. Yeah. You did it. You did it all yeah. Week. Yeah. Because we wanted to make sure we have a snapshot in time. We didn't want um, objections saying, oh, there's seasonal effects. There's this effect. There's that effect. So oh, we really oh. wanted to make sure. Yeah. Oh, gosh. Okay. And, and, and what week was that? This was good question. It's actually reported in the paper. Oh, okay. uh, it was in this. It was in. It was in fall, I believe. It was. Uh, it was sometimes in October, I believe. The, the yeah. fall of the fall of last year. Yeah, yeah. It was. Okay. It was in. It was in. It was in the fall. Uh, fall. Okay, I think. Well, I, yeah. I, the well, details I'm... are in the uh, in the paper, and of course, if if you don't have access to the paper, um, you know, just let me know, and I'll send you a PDF. Oh, well, I ha I have the study, yeah, so it's got to be in the study. Um, all right. Yes, so, it is. Uh, all right, let me call upon uh, O.C., uh, you have a question? Yes. First, I want to thank you for that study because it's just like fascinating and disturbing at the same time. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, I, I, I wonder if the study was done on like, if this was a weekend, like 2 a.m. or rush hour, so there are the rotations of train the, is, is a little different. Um, not to minimize the problem, but um, I'm just kind of wondering what when when um, you measure when did you do the study in our area? Um, and I do remember. I mean, like I don't know how the MTA arrived at that conclusion, but I do remember back 15 or so years ago when. I study environmental studies and I had one class with the Cornell Cooperative Extension and we measured the air in the South Bronx. And we the, the point of the study was to um, prove the, the EPA that their measurement to put those speakers or measure, measure equipment on the roofs of buildings is incorrect. We were sitting on the street where cars are driving by and people are walking. So I wonder, you I don't know if you know, how the MTA conducted their study and maybe their study had some, some issues uh, where they measure the particles and so forth. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, also you should also join the join the research team. I think I'm recruiting a whole bunch of people during this call, uh, Steve. Uh, so uh, yeah, I mean, the the, the in, indeed um, the we the timing uh, when we measure is 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 key. Uh, frequency of the trains are key. So we decided we would like to do this during rush hour because we wanted to capture when you have most um, sort of population impact, because that's when most of the people are, are traveling and exposed to, uh, you know, so we have, you know, daily 4 million people uh, you know, traveling in the New York City subway system. It used to be more, but now after COVID it's declined a bit. And I mean, 4 million people is a lot. As a matter of fact, uh, we have taken the study further and we have done origin destination analysis at census block level. And we know the duration of time uh, that a person is exposed to the particular concentration because we know the concentration profile across the uh, the the the, uh, the, the, tra the the travel path. Uh, of course, we also know the concentration inside of trains, right? Because we measured inside of trains. Incidentally, incidentally, concentrations inside of trains are not that much better. It's about half as much as the platforms. But to be honest with you, it's not that much better. I mean. Of course, MTA has done a great deal of work trying to make the ventilation work better, mostly due to the COVID concern. Uh, but, you know, when the doors open and all the stuff comes in, you know, there's, there's not much you can do when the doors open. 
So yes, the, also you have your, your question is correct. Now, question of how, what did MTA do? How they arrived at the conclusion? And I don't know. I do know that myself riding subways, I do see little samplers on the platforms continuously collecting. These are filter-based sampling systems, which are good because you can do composition analysis as well as concentration analysis. Um, but I have not seen a public study by MTA on this. And frankly, um, as a community uh, board, I would ask for that if I was you. And, and I guess my last part of my questions is, what is the health effect on us, on people that using the system twice a day, or as opposed to people that use the, those two train station only once a week or once a month, um, what, if there are any, if you have any data on that, that will be great. No, we, we actually have not, uh, have not, you know, I mean, this, we, we just actually just made the measurements. Um, uh, so, so, so we have not done any health impact analysis uh, on this, whether it's uh, somebody who is there once a week, uh, somebody is there twice uh, a day, or someone such as uh, transit police or MTA workers who are there eight hours a day. Yeah, yeah Jay, that's the big unknown the, uh, as to what the actual uh, health effects are for uh, the people who are uh, using those subway stations. That's right. I'm yeah. actually kind of looking into that as sort of a conceiving of a study, yeah. but that's very premature right now to kind of explain or describe because it's just, it needs to be vetted. And Actually, I'm, I'm looking at the study right now. Uh, um, um, Oh gosh, it was uh, I'm not, I'm not sure where it was published, but I mean it's entitled the atmospheric pollution research, or that's the uh, section. That's the, the one. That's that's that is the the, the journal name, and that's uh, the that's the name of the journal. Okay, and that's uh, the journal. so it looks as though most of the uh, um, most of the measurements were taken uh, during a a week in uh, December of uh, 2021 and on, mm -hmm. a, on, a, uh, uh, on two or three of the subway lines it was uh, uh, the measurements were taken in October of uh, 2021. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, e e even though you're from NYU um, you know th there's uh, and we, we have a representative from Columbia from the Columbia University mm -hmm. Medical Center who, who has mm -hmm. uh, joined our meeting. It Good. seems to me that uh, uh, that what you have found uh, has particular ramifications uh, for the uh, uh, for, uh, for the Columbia University Medical Center, which is located uh, right next to the 168 <laughs> subway station. Yeah, so, uh, I, I would hope that uh, there could be some uh, uh, cooperation between uh, you and Columbia. Uh, you would share the data, or share, maybe you know continue this research jointly, because it seems to me that, um, as I just said, uh, uh, Columbia should certainly have a direct interest. Uh, in, in what you found at 168th Street, if not also at 181st, but especially at 168th. I, Ross, I don't know if you, uh, uh, w w at what point you came in, uh, but- uh, I, I, I've been back on for about 10 minutes. And, and certainly, and, and by the way, Professor Gondieri, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, I apologize yes, hi. Not. Uh, I'm Ross Frommer, Vice President for Government and Community Affairs. Casey Crowley, who many of you may or may not know is our Vice President for Health and Environmental Safety. And I'd be happy to uh, connect uh, you to her so you have discussions about uh, uh, that. And obviously, yes, uh, I remember a, a statistics, and it's, please don't quote me on this because I could be way off. It's something like 40% of our employees use that um, subway mm. stop every day. Uh, mm -hmm. If that, again, apologizes, that number is off. I'm going straight from memory here. So it obviously is uh, very important. And, you know, and over the years, both us and NYP have invested a lot both in terms of our time, effort, and frankly, you know, several million dollars uh, in that subway station. So obviously, mm. we're concerned about it. And, and let me just say, for those of you who don't know, uh, although I work at Columbia, uh, my dad was a professor at NYU for many, many years. Oh. So to be fair, I don't know if you can see it, but my bag actually. <laughs> oh, oh, so that's fantastic. Oh, so so really, Ross, you have dual loyalties. Um, Please do a loyalty. Do a loyalty. So my, 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 <laughs> Thank my you very much. My paychecks still come from Columbia, <laughs> and my dad is not at NYU anymore. But 
What did he uh, do at NYU? What area was he in? He was at the dental school. He was a dental radiologist, but he okay. had wrote, sorry for more information than people want. He had wrote crew for Columbia when he was at, in college. So he became hmm. the faculty advisor for the NYU crew team. Hmm. Oh. There you go. All right, but, but, but seriously, Ross, I mean, uh, uh, you, you should take a look at, or you should maybe, uh, 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 Casey should take a look at that study because yep. it does seem, it, I, 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 as much as we've done to look at that station and we've looked at it maybe from a point of view of, it, of uh, aesthetics, maybe we haven't really looked at it in terms of uh, uh, what, what it means in terms of people's health. And, uh, um, mm -hmm. you know, it's not just a, it's not just a, a safety issue of, you know, mm -hmm. You know, for, in terms of personal mm -hmm. safety, but here, here, what uh, Professor Gandahari and his colleagues have raised are uh, mm -hmm. issues that may have consequences uh, for people's health. So we, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I would, uh, I, I would urge Columbia to also look into this question. You know, um, see, I should add one piece of information here that after the uh, um, you know post article came out, I, I was contacted by a transit police officer. And he said that, you know, for the past year or so, he has been getting uh, 500 milliliters of uh, blood transfusion, meaning extraction, uh, because his he has very high iron content. Wow. Uh, and so he needs to do this in order to be well. And he said he has very difficult time breathing. And and so, you know, the, 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 I, I, I I believe we, if we look further, we will be able to draw causal connections here. All right, uh, uh, Jody Herson uh, uh, has a question or a comment. Yeah, uh, just a comment, Steve. I think that you know everything I'm hearing, and I think it's you know a serious concern. But my biggest concern is the the fact that the MTA studies are completely different from the NYU studies, and I really think that we do have to go out and ask the MTA what what how they did their studies um, because. I think this is really concerning. And if we're going to ultimately resolve some of these problems, I think we really have to look at, at I mean, they're saying that everything is completely safe. Mm -hmm. I know, but do, do we know, what, Professor, that, uh, that the MTA has actually done a study? Do, do, we know, do we know that to be a fact? Well, you know, I mean, in, in the scientific world, um, a study is is valid only when it is peer reviewed among you know basically subject matter experts i have not seen any but you know i i um, you know and, and i believe we've we've done um, due diligence in 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 searching but i, I think as a community uh, board uh, you're entitled to uh, ask the question that uh, you, you know, you say you've done studies and you found it safe. Can we please see the data yes. and the methodology and right. the results and whether this publication was, you know, peer reviewed? This okay. study was peer reviewed or not? It's, it's a very simple question. And then please let me know when you get it because I'm very curious. Well, yeah, well, I, I, I would certainly ask you to take a look at it. Um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you, uh, uh, Jody, uh, uh, do, do you have another point or not? No, I just think that uh, okay. um, in order to move forward in looking at all this, and I hope also that we get you know some feedback as you move further into your studies to determine exactly you know what what we could possibly do you know and your recommendations and attempting to to deal with some of these issues in the subways. Right. Well, yeah, we, you know, as far as recommendations, I, I have to say that. I really um, don't have a recommendation because this is the kind of thing that, that MTA, if MTA then, the, the, the data is available, they can use it. I mean, I, you know, just, but they, they are the owners of, of this animal, right? They understand the subway system. They know that every single detail, the age, the speeds, everything there is. So they are the ones who can draw conclusions on what is the cause and how can it be fixed. You know, we are, I'm not a subject matter expert in the subway system, they are. However, getting together with them, we should be able to uh, come up with a solution sooner or later. 
Well, we certainly would hope so. Um, uh, OC. Uh, uh, yeah, it's one more point I was just thinking about is, uh, in my view, there should be additional study of the people that live or work right on the ground level at that area right above 168th Street and 181st Street to see what's their, what, if there are any health issues. And, and actually, well, I, I don't know how, how that contamination being uh, transferred, is that airborne or is it something, um, mm -hmm. uh, it, it is airborne? Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so so yeah, that's that will be very interesting to know how is that mm. health wise, how is it affecting people that leave mm. or work right above those stations? Hmm. That's actually an interesting idea. I mean, the, the thing that one could perhaps even go to the, you know, take samples, make measurements right above the grill, uh, the grills above the subway system at various stations and kind of uh, 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 vet the, the hypothesis of depth being a contributing factor. Okay. All right, very good. Uh, all right, are there any other, uh, I don't see any other questions for uh, the professor. Um, did, did you say that you're, right now you're overseas? Yeah, yeah, I'm actually in Spain right now, but oh my I God. figured I better join anyway, yeah. Oh my God, thank you. <laughs> Well, thank you for agreeing to uh, to do this. Um, no problem. It's I, I, important, I mean, it, so it's not a big deal. Uh, well, it it, it 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 certainly doesn't sound as though you're in Spain. Um, that, this is amazing. <laughs> but uh, thank you very much, and uh, and I, I hope uh, if, if as uh, uh, as further uh, research is done by your group, I hope uh, uh, you'll come to us and uh, and give us the benefit of uh, of, of what you found. And, uh, well, we, you know, you you may you may find things popping up again in 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 uh, the press as well. So, um, uh, incidentally, the El Mundo uh, just did an interesting television series on 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 this. So, for the Spanish speaking uh, community, it'd be uh, you can oh, spread the word uh, in Very your good. neighborhood. All right, because uh, well, the, 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 these two stations in particular, uh, you know, uh, to a great extent, serve a, a Spanish speaking community. So that would be mm -hmm. certainly appropriate. Yeah. Well, right. good luck uh, to to you all, and stay well. Okay. Good luck to you, and uh, I, I hope you I hope you're on vacation uh, and, uh, and 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 enjoying your stay in Spain. <laughs> and uh, I I, yeah. I I truly appreciate it. I had no, of course, I had no idea when you wrote back and said you would agree to do this uh, that you were over in Spain. Uh, so it's I, not a big it's not a big deal. It's just uh, a couple of hours of sleep. That's all. Oh, well, okay. It is to me. It is a big deal. And I, I I appreciate the fact that you did this. Um, Not a problem. All right. Thank you so much. Okay. Take thank it easy. You. Bye. 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 Wow. Uh, well, <laughs> yeah. That, that is something else. Um. So. Uh, on the agenda. Uh. All right, so uh, under uh, old business, we covered the DEP uh, service request on the uh, street and cl uh, sidewalk cleanliness ratings. Uh, there are no uh, uh, no new ratings that have been published since our last meeting. And um, on the uh, recycling statistics um, uh, uh, for uh, the, the latest month available, month of March, um, uh, the, the amount of uh, metal, glass, and plastic uh, tonnage the amount of paper that's been collected, actually even the amount of uh, overall uh, refuse, uh, all, all of those numbers are uh, uh, have uh, declined since uh, last year, since 2022, in including organics. So all across the board, uh, uh, somehow we've uh, we've been putting out uh, less recyclables and less uh, and less garbage as a whole. And so the diversion rate uh, for our district in the month of March was 15.4%. A year ago, it was at sixteen percent, and um, and at fifteen point four, uh, we are among the lowest districts in Manhattan. Uh, di uh, we're above uh, districts. Uh, we're only above districts uh, three, ten, and eleven, and uh, all the other districts are uh, uh, up in the uh, range of uh, around twenty five percent or so uh, for their diversion rates. Uh, uh, district nine is uh, is a little bit above us at. Uh, 
uh, at 16.3. Um, is, is there any other uh, old business? Uh, so now we come to a new business. Um, yeah, actually. Yes? I just want to briefly report. First of all, it was really nice of Julio to follow up when I complained about the poor service and results I had in my stay at Allen Hospital. The uh, community relation, the uh, patient relations person from Allen got in touch with me and said she checked on all the points I uh, raised. And uh, I think it was a waste of time for both me and her and nothing was accomplished. Uh, no good information was adduced. And some of, she did give me a written reply of, of two pages and some of it was inaccurate and others of it was just to repeat what the official policy of the hospital was. And she avoided several uh, important questions in the course of that. And uh, I, I felt the whole effort was, was a waste of time, but I do appreciate the fact that Julio followed up on, on the question. And I, I thought that, that, that at least that much was a, a good sign. Um, okay, well, well uh, I'm, I'm glad that Julio at least followed up. And actually, I'm glad that you uh, mentioned Julio because uh, he's not here tonight, but I did want to uh, uh, give uh, uh, a brief report myself about a, a meeting that I went to yesterday uh, at uh, actually at the uh, Allen Hospital of the uh, uh, of the uh, Community Leadership Council for New York Presbyterian, of which I'm a member. So, uh, uh, so speaking of disappointment, uh, I was very disappointed because we still have no information, uh, no real update uh, about the uh, reinstatement of the psych beds uh, that were uh, eliminated at the Allen Hospital. Uh, what we've been told is that uh, what we were told yesterday was that uh, they're in high level discussions with the state. And uh, uh, but they don't uh, uh, give us any real information about uh, what they're talking about and where they might be moving these beds. As they've told us previously, uh, they don't want to return them to Willie Allen. Uh, they will remain in the community, uh, but we don't know where in the community they plan to uh, put these beds or when they're ever going to reach a uh, um, an agreement with the state and and actually bring back the beds. The state had previously said they wanted all these beds uh, back in operation as of April the first. And uh, we're now uh, two months past that deadline, and uh, we still don't have the uh, psych beds. Uh, I'm also disappointed. We, you know, we we were told that they're still working on a a, a plan for the uh, construction of the new building on Broadway uh, between 169th and 170th streets. Um, and at some point in the near future, maybe uh, they will uh, uh, report to us on how they uh, met, uh, are planning to proceed. They are apparently moving in the direction of demolishing all of the stores on that block front. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, they do plan to uh, put, uh, take advantage of a program. Uh, I think it's called, uh, maybe it's called Art in the Heights in which the artwork would be placed in the uh, windows of uh, vacant stores uh, throughout our community. And they've offered up uh, those vacant storefronts uh, for, the, for artwork uh, for whatever period of time uh, prior to the demolition of that block. And they did tell us that they are actively looking for a new restaurant uh, to take over the Coogan space. And uh, I, uh, I pleaded with them personally uh, uh, and I admitted it for selfish reasons. Please get a restaurant there as quickly as you can. Uh, we, we need it. Um, at least I need it. because uh, they don't. As, Especially as we resume doing our community board meetings in person. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm almost on automatic. I, I come out of a community board meeting at, uh, as I did uh, recently at Rustbury, and I turned to my right to head up to Coogan's and then realize it's pointless. There's no Coogan's there anymore. Uh, by the way, there is a book uh, that's coming out next week uh, about uh, Coogan's. Last Call at Coogan's. Is, uh, uh, it's been reviewed in the New York Times and uh, elsewhere, I believe, and it's, uh, the official publication date is uh, June the 6th. 
Uh, there's an event in the community uh, uh, near where Jody lives, uh, where uh, there'll be a book launch party on uh, June the 10th at uh, 8, uh, 876 uh, Riverside Drive. Um, Steve, Steve, can I, just say, I actually bumped into Dave Hunt earlier uh, this evening. Oh. And he says about retirement that he couldn't be happier. Yeah, well, you know, that uh, that's, you know, well, good for Dave. But <laughs> yeah, I know he looked, he posts all these pictures on Facebook. He, he, yeah, he looks very, very happy. But, uh, uh, and I, I, I assume, we, I know that we're going to see him again on uh, June the 10th. Um, uh, uh, Jay, did you have a comment? Um, yeah, the, the, about that building on Broadway. Yes. The original plan was to have uh, small residential facilities for uh, uh, residents and other students of, of uh, Presbyterian who needed a place to live for the duration of their stay to study in uh, all the various Columbia programs in, in our neighborhood to live there. And also, to have something which they can't call a hotel, but which is in every way, shape, or form a hotel, uh, um, which is actually needed for people who are staying to visit patients at the hospital and don't have a facility within easy walking distance of the hospital at present. Um, now, it's my understanding, since that's really a hotel, that they need a zoning variance to, be, to, to access that space for that purpose. I don't know that it's a bad idea that they get it. I think that that uh, service is actually needed. Well, th this is a, probably a question you should direct to the uh, uh, land use staff at the borough president's office. Um, I mean, I, I, I'm not, I don't, uh, no one here tonight, I think is really equipped to uh, answer whether or not it, it's the equivalent of a hotel or not, because it, it would be limited uh, to, uh, uh, to the patient's families. And, and not to the general public, and and it's also my, it was also my understanding that the uh, residential units uh, were not necessarily uh, only for Columbia students. I thought they were for uh, employees of the hospital. But uh, uh, but these are points that hopefully will be clarified in the near future. One thing that the hospital representative did say at our meeting yesterday was that uh, they are working with Columbia on this project. Uh, so uh, uh, may, maybe they have uh, broadened it out. Uh, to include uh, Columbia students. Um, oh, and, and as to the the Allen Hospital, uh, while I was a patient there, I made inquiries about the psych unit, and several concerned residents actually assured me there's no possibility of a psych unit ever at Allen. Well, I think uh, I think the hospital. Just I think the as, hospital is, as you said. Well, the hospital, I think, has made it clear that they don't plan on bringing it back there. And uh, and then I don't know whether the state is asking them to do it or not. We don't we don't know what they're being what's being discussed with the state. But, you know, something yeah. I just realized uh, that I passed over Ross. Ross was supposed to give his uh, before we got, got into this old old business was supposed to give his report. Uh, from uh, Columbia University Irving Medical Center. So uh, why don't I turn it back to uh, Ross at this point? Okay, uh, thank you, Steve. I don't have a lot, just a couple of quick announcements. Uh, one is that we are very excited. We are gonna be holding our first in-person uh, community research forum uh, since the pandemic. Uh, this is events that we had done about two or three times a year prior to the pandemic where we invite uh, members of the public, but primarily members of this community to come in here uh, from our faculty about some of the latest research they're doing on various subject matters. Uh, this focus is going to be on cancer research, and it's going to be on Tuesday, June 20th. 
from six to eight at the Irving Cancer Research Center, which is the building on St. Nicholas between 166 and 167. Um, I have a draft of the poster. I am finalizing it and we'll get it, probably hope to get it to you tomorrow, uh, to the board staff tomorrow to distribute. Uh, but like I said, this is our first sort of real big uh, in-person event that we've done since the pandemic. So we're very excited. We want to get as many uh, folks to attend uh, as possible. I encourage you to attend and to spread the word. Much appreciated. There'll also be a small reception afterwards. So there'll be an opportunity to chat, uh, you know, sort of more intimately with some of the faculty uh, who will be there. Um, we're also this summer, and I don't have the exact date, we are going to do our project medical education in person. We did it live in person last summer, and it went off without a hitch. Well, the, the, no major hitch. We had our usual hitches of running behind and other logistical issues. But I know we have a couple of PME alums uh, on the call. So uh, if you know, if you are interested in participating, you know someone who's interested in participating, uh, please look for an invitation. Uh, please let me know. We'll try to get the invites out sometime in early July. We hope to do this sometime the first week in August. I don't have the exact date. Um, yet. Um, Green Market starts this coming Tuesday, uh, every Tuesday between now and uh, November on Fort Washington between 168 and 169. Technically, this is not us, but obviously it occurs uh, sort of right on our campus. So I just want to make sure folks uh, know. Uh, Velocity, which is our annual uh, bike uh, I don't want to call it a race because nobody, you're not supposed to go fast. Bike event to raise money for our cancer programs will be on Sunday, October 8th. Um, once again, I'm pretty sure we'll be able to offer free to, to waive the admissions fee for community residents. Uh, I can't waive the fundraising minimums, but I can waive, we can probably get the uh, entry fee waived for community residents. Uh, for those of you who may be bi uh, bicyclists, know that we're actually not going to be on the west side of the Hudson this year. Uh, we're all going to be completely on the east side of the Hudson this year, starting Westchester County, uh, finishing uh, on, on campus. Uh, for those of you who have ever biked up the Palisades and you realize why it's called the Palisades, uh, this is a very welcome uh, change. And then finally, uh, earlier today, um, Dean Armstrong announced that uh, Dr. Ola Gide Williams, many of you, uh, who many of you may have known, he's a neurologist has been appointed vice dean for community health uh, programs. So we'll be doing a lot more work uh, with my office and with Rafi and the other folks here working on community. Uh, I haven't had a chance, I congratulated JD, I haven't had a chance to speak to him today. So get a better idea what that's gonna involve. And then after 22 years come um, July 1st, Columbia University will have a new president. Uh, we will be welcoming Dr. Uh, Manu Shefty who is currently the Dean of the London School of Economics, will be taking over as, I don't know what number, the uh, president of Columbia University. Uh, again, she starts July 1st. So a lot, lot of change going on here, both uptown and downtown. And happy to take any questions. Well, let me just uh, maybe amplify one of the points you made about uh, uh, the project medical education, because uh, uh, the, the name doesn't really convey uh, the type of experience it is and, and, and how it's an all day event, uh, ta uh, taking uh, members of the community uh, from one uh, point, uh, from one, uh, uh, one school at Columbia to another one, to another lab. Uh, uh, you get to see the inner workings of the institution. You get to see all sorts of different uh, things that are going on there, um, in, including uh, uh, this great little thing, of course, I talk about it all the time, in which uh, somebody is slicing a brain and, uh, and it, it, uh, it, it's, it's a bit strange, but uh, uh, it's part of science. But uh, it, for people who want to really experience what goes on inside the medical center, um, it, it's a, it's a, it, I think it's a great experience. It's something you should do. You should, uh, uh, if you have, if you can uh, give up a whole day in August, uh, you should do it. Uh, I, I, I recommend it to any members of, of the community board. It really gives you some good insight into all the different aspects, uh, uh, to a lot of the different aspects. Uh, to, uh, of the medical center. Well, Steve, Steve, I appreciate that. And certainly uh, CB12 is really sort of our, our primary target audience, uh, if, if you will. We on all members of the community, but I especially love it when CB12 members uh, participate. Just on the name, you're actually right, Steve, because it involves folks from all four schools. 
uh, but we are part of a national program that is run through the Association of American Medical Colleges. And so Project Medical Education is their name, not ours. But if we want to be part of this national effort, that's what we have to call it to be identified with. The, the stuff like programs like this go on across the country at different medical schools in different forms and teaching hospitals. Uh, and the PME is sort of the nationwide brand. Yeah, but uh, yeah, yeah, that should be like the uh, uh, the uh, subhead. Uh, we, we should come up with a uh, a more exciting uh, t uh, name for the program, and then you could uh, you you could still say underneath uh, Project Medical Education. Fair uh, enough. Fair that's enough. That's my recommendation. Okay. So uh, uh, the, the, thank you, Ross. Uh, thank you for taking time out tonight. Um, and uh, um, uh, we we have a couple of people who want to speak on uh, on the uh, on a couple of on, I think maybe on the same topic. Uh, concerning the 5G uh, uh, towers uh, that are being uh, planned or proposed for uh, uh, our community and others throughout the city. Uh, so is, uh, is Sue Peters uh, still with us? I see her on the list. Uh, uh, Sue Peters, uh, you should now be able to talk. Oh, yes, thank you. Um, I've spoken at your board and uh, in the public sessions a number of times. And I just want to say that um, this issue of the 32 feet tall jumbo 5G towers that have been going into all of the communities in the five boroughs, and they're expect to have they're all on the sidewalk. They expect ultimately, now they have like 100 to 150 installed, but they expect to have 4,000 of them. And they will have a 5G antenna along with four other antennas, five antennas in each tower, 32 feet, 10 feet from people's residences and business. And in, um, in Manhattan, there are already one, two, three, four, five, six community boards that have passed moratorium or disapproval of them. CB 2, 5, 8, 9, 10, and 11. The- I'm sorry, could you, could you read off those numbers again? 2, 5, 8, 9, 10, and 11. And there is going to be on June 6th, next Wednesday, June 6th at 1 p.m. at City Hall, the City Council's Committee on Technology is having a public session and will hear a comments from the public on these polls specifically. So I would hope that someone on your committee could at least uh, listen to it or even speak in testimony. They're giving two minutes for everybody to speak in testimony. And listening would be good because there's going to be a lot of community people there. Uh, Sue, uh, Sue, yes. Sue I, I think that meeting is on uh, June 7th. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, you're right. <laughs> is that Wednesday? Uh, uh, yes. Uh, okay. I, I, I have it at June 7th at one o'clock. Yes, that's it. And it's at City Hall. Right. I'm going to be there in person to testify, but you can also go on Zoom. Right. You know, and um, we really need a, a real presentation to your board here because this is really serious. I especially there's so many issues. There's um, land use issues. There's um, insurance issues, but there's huge amount of health issues. And I'll just tell you one other thing about that. The FCC limits, the limits that say everything below the limit from the FCC is safe. That's what they say. That limit was put in in 1996. Do you know how many cell phones were in New York City in that very little? And they continue to hold on to that limit, which, and they were, they were brought to court, federal court, and in, they lost the case in 2021. They were brought to court because the people said there are 11,000 pages of peer-reviewed scientific uh, studies showing harm below your limits. 
And, and the court said to the FCC, they said, you have to go back and you have to look at that 11,000 pages and then come back and tell us what your reason is for not changing your guidelines. And they have not answered the court since then. That was 2021. So uh, your, your uh, federal uh, government isn't protecting you. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, um, uh, well uh, thank you, Sue. And, um, you know, th this is an issue that uh, uh, was referred to our uh, Traffic and Transportation Committee uh, because of the uh, question of the uh, towers being installed on sidewalks. And um, um, so it, 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 uh, this, this is, I think, maybe the first time that uh, we've had anyone speak on the topic before us. Um, so I, I, I appreciate the, I appreciate that. Uh, Arnold Gore also wants to speak. Um, uh, Arnold, you can now speak. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm Arnold Gore. Uh, I'm from Brooklyn, New York now, but I lived in Washington Heights for 30 years. There was a great deal of scientific and uh, medical evidence linking elevated brain cancer incidents, neurological problems, and decreased fertility to wireless uh, communications. Uh, uh, for example, um, cellular telephone infrastructure was rolled out from 1996 to 1998 in the United States. In New York City, it was installed in late November 1996. Upper Manhattan's former councilman, Stanley Michaels, died of brain cancer in 2008. He was not alone. Among I, 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 I don't think it was brain cancer. It was a... Uh... It, it was a blood cancer. I don't think it was brain cancer. Um, uh, um, I, I'm, I know he was operated on for uh, a brain uh, for a brain cancer. I don't think so. I'll, no. okay, I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll ask his family, but uh, okay. I, that's not my memory. Yeah. And of course, right. as you know, as yeah, you know well, I know you were a lot closer to him than I was. You were, yeah, uh, yeah, as you know, I, I worked I worked for him for close to twenty four years. Yeah. yeah. Um, um, among political luminaries, follow, uh, he was not alone. He was followed by Ted Kennedy and John McCain. The, uh, the Federal Communications Commission has uh, called, uh, uh, has, has failed to update its standards, as uh, Sue has, uh, has told you. But the court that issued that ruling was one level below the Supreme Court of the United States. Uh, and the... Uh, uh, Center for uh, for Ethics in, in Government at Harvard has uh, said that the, the Federal Communications Commission is a captured agency and we cannot uh, depend upon uh, their uh, protection. Uh, but uh, uh, when cell phones were introduced in New York City in 1996, the death rate according to the Center for Disease Control monthly mortality weekly report, increased 10% in New York City. And uh, an epidemiologist from the uh, New York City Department of Health said she knew about this, but they thought it was an anomaly at the time. But the same thing happened when it was rolled out in other cities. It went up 27% in Los Angeles, California. But the the death rate went up and lasted for about 11 weeks, then came down. The electrically sensitive people died off, and we are left with uh, uh, a situation in which uh, the electrically sensitive people are the canaries in the coal mine who are signaling to us that something is out there, and as the power of 5G keeps on getting greater and greater, more and more people are being pulled into the electrically sensitive area. Now, there was a recent study uh, uh, reporting that uh, uh, that primary brain cancers have increased in all of the countries of the world, which are highly industrialized and developed. With the income is income level is higher, and there is greater uh, cell phone usage. Brain cancer in young adults has been remarkably increased. Uh, uh, glioblastoma a multiform has uh, increased dramatically as a result of that. And uh, uh, 
the the city of New York still has under the Telecommunications Act the power to regulate the siting and placement of um, of infrastructure for telecommunications. Uh, we still have the right to uh, deny a permit for infrastructure if a cellular telephone conversation can be completed. And in New York City, there are very few places where there is a gap in service. So these installations can be denied, only it is much easier to uphold that denial if the city enacts a uh, zoning and siting regulation, such as was done in Woodstock, New York. So that's uh, the extent of my presentation. And so, thank you. Do, do, do me a favor, just, just repeat the last sentence. Just repeat the last sentence. Um, yeah. uh, the, uh, the, there was a, uh, uh, zoning regulation passed in Woodstock, New York, which uh, uh, was a model form, but it would have to be tailored to the needs of New York City in particular. Only uh, the denials are much easier to sustain if you have a uh, zoning and siting regulation in place. And, and are, are you quoting somebody with? Uh... Uh, uh, well, um, I am. Um, I am quoting uh, 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 a person in Woodstock, New York, who was oh. instrumental in getting this uh, law passed, where they oh. okay. had a a zoning law set up, right. which has been able to regulate these installations. Right. Well, I mean, it, it does make sense. Doesn't make sense. All right. Um, uh, thank you, Arnold. Okay. Um, thank you. Uh, all right, so you're, you're no longer living at 720 Fort Wash. No, I moved away. We have grandchildren, so I moved to Brooklyn <laughs> eight okay. years ago. All right, well, good to be closer to the grandchildren. Right. Oh, well, good. Okay, well, good for you. Um, uh, are there any uh, questions for either Arnold or Sue? All right, very good. All right. Um, well, I, I, think, um, I, I think this committee does need to look into this issue uh, further. And uh, I, I have asked uh, the chair of the board to uh, uh, to uh, provide me with some information that she has about the uh, uh, the sites of the I, you know the sites that have been um, uh, that have been indicated as uh, where these these five G towers are supposed to be built. I haven't seen the list. I'd like to know where do they plan to put them? Uh, because I mean, the, among the first three or so that we heard about, it, uh, at least two of them didn't make any sense to me at all. Uh, the ones up on Fort Washington Avenue. Uh, so uh, I, I'd like to know where else they plan to put them. Uh, Steve, so on top of that, I think to make any resolution strong or stronger, we should, whenever possible, we, we should invite experts in the field yeah. to give us a presentation about that. Right. And right, so well, that's really important. Yeah, but, but I, I, at this <laughs> At this rate, we may have to see how this issue unfolds uh, over the summer and uh, and try to deal with it when we come back in September. Um, uh, that's just the, uh, the, the the that's just how our uh, schedule on how our schedule uh, on <coughs> lays out. So, uh, 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 Jay, do you have a question or comment? Yeah, um, just just on the subject of five G towers. Um, we don't really know. I mean, uh, I don't know that it makes sense. I think, I think what Osi said makes more sense. Let's, let's get the facts rather than jump in to say, oh, we're, we're risking our lives and the, the whole world is collapsing. And besides that, everything gives you cancer. Uh, so I've got some concern with the question of jumping into this right away. Uh, well, we I did have a presentation at the Traffic and Transportation Committee on the subject because these towers are supposed to be put on sidewalks in our neighborhood. 
Right. And what Steve said is absolutely right. It looks like two of them makes no sense whatsoever being placed on Cabrini Boulevard above 190th Street and across from the playground, I believe, the Javits Playground. I, I don't understand the purpose of that either. Um, the location of one of them, I believe, is in a place where no one lives on Cabrini Boulevard. Is that what you were referring to, Steve? Yeah, well, one of them was outside. <coughs> uh, one of them was outside. Uh... Uh, what used to be St. Elizabeth's Hospital at 689 Fort Wash at, yeah. at 190th Street. And uh, the, the other one I'm, I'm unclear about was on, on which side of uh, Javits Playground it was to be located. Uh, but that didn't seem to make any sense to me either. I mean, if and the ones on Cabrini Boulevard, which are not which are above 900 yeah. West, uh, West 190th Street. Well, I, uh, I, I don't so make I, much sense either, as well, far I, I, as I can tell. Well, I think um, I think we may be talking about the same ones, but um, yeah. Now but, the DOT uh, really didn't have much to say when they showed up at the meeting, and they deferred to their contractor to explain the locations of them, and he started set off by saying, "Well, of course, Cabrini Boulevard." is a major thoroughfare, which is news to all of us. It's a tertiary well, road. But I thought the point of these towers is to uh, provide uh, a Wi-Fi service to uh, uh, underserved areas. And uh, I, 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 don't, I, I, I wouldn't- I wish, they put one, I wish they put one in front of my apartment house. Well, is well. my feelings on the subject. Yeah, well, yeah, maybe maybe you need it. Okay, but uh, I, I, I think uh, we're going to need to do a lot more research, And I do, but I do appreciate uh, the fact that Sue and Arnold uh, came before us tonight and uh, stuck it out uh, till the end of our meeting. Um, uh, so uh, I, I, I think um, we, we've covered our agenda, um, uh, un unless, uh, unless uh, anyone has any announcements. Um, I, I could announce that... Uh, uh, Tuesday morning, uh, June the 6th at 10 o'clock, uh, the Parks Department and many others will be celebrating the 175th anniversary of the High Bridge, uh, the oldest uh, standing bridge in New York City. Uh, people from Manhattan will meet uh, people from the Bronx in, in the middle of the bridge and uh, hopefully will shake hands. Uh, so uh, uh, everybody of, uh, on the community board, everybody in the community is uh, welcome uh, to join that celebration. It only happens uh, once every 175 years. Um, so uh, you, know, you, you, you certainly don't want to have to wait around for the next one. Um, uh, 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 jo uh, Jody, uh, you have something? Yeah, I just wanted to mention one thing, Steve, that you and I talked about over the week that um, our building participated um, recently in the free smoke detector and carbon monoxide installation program. It was a vertical installation. It was incredibly positive. They came in, they were here for four days. They hit every one of our apartments. Um, they spent about, depending on, on the needs of the particular apartment, they installed both carbon monoxide and smoke detectors throughout everybody's apartment for free and um, did every one of our units. And it was a pretty and unbelievably professional. Um, and, and, uh, Jody, did you say that that was done by the fire department? It was done, I believe it's through, the, the way we organized it was through Sandra Sanchez a couple of months ago. She did a presentation here for the community board and she talked about her free pro, the free program. And I believe it's between the Red Cross and the fire department, but they do organize it. And Steve, you asked me to see if she could provide us with a flyer or something about the program. She has provided me with their educational program. And what they like to do is they like to do an edu come into your building, 
or your school. I didn't know they do schools, but they also do schools and they do about a 35 minute educational program based on your building. And then following that, they set up the free um, installation of the smoke detectors and uh, carbon monoxide. And it was pretty amazing, I have to say. And then I also followed up with her about the, um, the lithium ion batteries and the if they had any flyers that we could also post on the website. And she does have both a Spanish and an English flyer that I also uh, think were pretty amazing on the safety tips and precautions associated with the lithium battery specifically. And then they do a separate one on uh, the e-bike. And so I can, you let me know what how you want me to proceed and and would you like to see all of this first and then, well, I, um, I I think I've seen, somebody in my building has posted the uh, uh, the uh, the flyer about the lithium ion batteries. In fact, I mean it's, it's like all over my building right now. It's on the bulletin board. It's on in the <laughs> uh, it's at the front entrance. It's uh, next to the mailboxes. Uh, you can't walk in my building without seeing that poster. Uh, but uh, uh, be, uh, basically, I think we have a particular concern about uh, uh, one of our uh, uh, neighbors. But um, I I. I uh, I uh, could you. I think you should send that poster to uh, Ebenezer and to okay. and to uh, Catherine, and uh, you should urge them. Tell them that uh, it was discussed here at our committee meeting, and we believe uh, that it should be sent out to the public at large uh, by the okay. community board. Uh, and then, the, likewise, also the uh, educational program for yes, the uh, absolutely free yeah. carbon monoxide. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, we we need to spread the word. We we had. Uh, I, I mean, uh, we we had an awful tragedy in our community uh, just a few weeks ago with. Four people died on 190th Street uh, because of a fire that was uh, uh, triggered by one of these lithium-ion batteries. I mean, this community board uh, needs to uh, uh, needs to be fully involved in educating people about the dangers of those batteries. No, I agree. Do, so I'll do that. We, yeah, and do uh, we, I'm sorry, Osi. I actually have a question related to that. Do we know if? Um, Insur- insurance companies um, giving like a better rate if um, the building doesn't have anyone with those batteries that are storing in their houses or I mean like in their apartments or or um, anything like that. Do we know? Because that's becoming an issue. Yeah. And I know some buildings are actually um, banning those those batteries, like you know, bicycles, but absolutely not. They should be, but um, I, I, I don't think we have an answer to that question. Okay. Uh, uh, let me just. Uh, uh, Jill McManus has p- p- put something in the chat, which I think is uh, 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 a, a good point. Uh, her, uh, her statement here is: once that uh, we're talking now, going back to the five G towers. Once the uh, towers are installed, it will be nearly impossible to get them taken down. Better to ask for an extension now for comment and get to a resolution for a moratorium until more is known about the health effects. It was my understanding that Catherine Diaz, our chair, has been pushing for an extension on the comment uh, period. So I will uh, I will check in with her again to see if she's uh, if she's still doing that. Um, but I, I appreciate that comment. Um, and uh, Jill has also uh, posted a link to uh, uh, um, what she says is reliable information on the science of, uh, uh, and I, now I lost it, um, on the radio frequency radiation. Uh, and so that's also now in the chat. All right, is uh, 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 Tanisha, would you like to, do you have any uh, words for us? This has been great, great being, um, I'll be back. Oh, well, that's what I wanted to hear. I wanted to hear that you'll be back. Cause as you can see, we cover a lot of, uh, interesting material and uh, uh, we get involved with a lot of important issues. All right, so I think um, at uh, at, at uh, 8.48 uh, p.m., I think we'll, we'll bring this meeting to a close. I wanna thank you all for uh, uh, joining us and uh, I guess we're gonna see each other on again on uh, September 7th, if not before. So, uh, uh, and- if, Can we uh, try to have a conversation about trauma center? And uh, maybe some textile recycling by any chance in September. Um, what was the first thing you suggested? Trauma, trauma center. Oh yes. 
Oh, um, I, I also brought that up at the meeting uh, 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 yesterday at the hospital. And, um, um, and I, you know, I, we, I need to do a little more research with uh, EMS and uh, maybe with the state health department. I was told by one of the emergency physicians uh, uh, at, uh, at the hospital uh, that the hospital does get some of the uh, trauma cases. Um, when, I guess when EMS decides that they, that they don't have enough time uh, to take a patient over to Harlem Hospital or- uh, That's uh, not true. What? That's not true. Well, as this, we all know, this year, someone was shot on 165th Street and Broadway and brought to St. Barnabas. Well, well that, that and was, I, while our general meeting was going on, a couple of blocks away, someone was shot. And they were brought to Metropolitan Hospital. I'm not sure. I think in that case, they were just brought there and con to confirm they were still dead. But based on those two cases. Well, well again, okay, Jay, anything. again, what, again, what I said is that when I'm, uh, maybe I wasn't clear enough. What he told me is that on occasion, and they, they certainly aren't getting the bulk of the trauma cases. The bulk of them are clearly going to Harlem Hospital or, or elsewhere. And, and, and in the case of the guy who was recently shot at Broadway to 162nd Street, yes, I pointed this out at the meeting yesterday. He was taken all the way across town to Metropolitan. And we've had other people take it all the way over to, uh, uh, to St. Barnabas in the Bronx. But what the guy tells me is that once in a while, EMS will bring them one of these patients uh, if if they feel as though there's a, uh, uh, you know, they, they can't afford to lose any more time, perhaps. But uh, this is definitely an issue that uh, uh, that we need to uh, push further. Okay. So but, it's, uh, but it's also an issue that uh, uh, that has been discussed with the hospital for years. And uh, uh, but you know, but it's uh, I think we're we're bringing it back, to, putting it back on the table again. Yeah. Okay. All right. So this meeting has not was not adjourned at uh, eight uh, uh, at eight forty eight. It is now being adjourned at eight fifty one. Uh, so uh, uh, thank you all, and uh, we'll be in touch. Bye. Bye.